right. And uh, welcome back to one of the, I would say, probably the most recognizable guests of the show, which is Paul Diaz, who is the uh, founder of Higher Power Consulting and also the founder and CEO of Offer First. We're going to chat more on Offer First because it's the new venture and uh, some exciting stuff going on there. And then last but not least, uh, I think most people must have been sleeping under a rock, right? Know that uh, Paul's been kind of the, the leader, at least the, the vocal leader for sure, on the in the veterinary non-compete. We're going to chat through lots of different stuff today, but First and foremost, you know it's not going to be boring because Paul and I both are uh, ha- have lots of opinions and I think we'll uh, be able to, to entertain. So, Paul, thank you so much for being here and how are you doing? I'm doing great, Isaiah. I'm glad to be back. Yeah, it's it was great to see you in uh, Florida at VMX. And um, it was kind of neat to see people just come up and, uh, I mean, I heard a couple times and I wasn't, you know, we weren't around each other a ton, but just saying thanks, um, you know, telling you, you know, just, I think, encouragement, right? So, I just wanted to ask how, uh, the reception at VMX, WVC, how it was, any notable conversations, things that you want to share, whether it's stories, other things, um, kind of what, what what did that look like for you? Yeah, VMX, uh, VMX and WVC were, were really fun this year for me. Um, you know, it was, VMX was, was overwhelming. Um, I had... I had those uh, a couple of veterinarians buy those t-shirts for me with yeah, my name on it and, and the non compete on the back. And, uh, you know, that, that went over really well. So the, the support that I got from, you know, just veterinary professionals in general was, like I said, just overwhelming. I, uh, it was emotional at times. Um, I've had, pe- I had people coming up to me, just thanking me for what I was doing and encouraging me to keep, to continue it. Um, sharing their stories about non-competes with me. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really overwhelming. It was the first time that I, that I got to actually interact with people who were my supporters, right? So most of it, or all of it prior to that was just online, right? The messages, emails, things like that. And now, you know, having people come up to me and saying, Hey, you're Paul Diaz. And, you know, obviously they recognize Stella. She's, she's my big giveaway, but, um, yeah. You know, just having people come up to me and thank me and, and and hug me, shake my hand, it was it really was overwhelming, and it and it uh it solidified the fact that you know I, I was doing the right thing, right? And and these people deserve a strong advocate who's going to stand up for the injustices that they're facing. Yeah, the the t shirt. I mean, I had the biggest smile on my face when I saw. It. I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it took me a little bit of courage. I had to build up some courage <laughs> to put that thing on, but. You know, the fact that it was a gift, I, I really didn't have a choice. I was going to yeah, wear it. Yeah, it was awesome. Them. Yeah, when you when you yeah. told me like that some folks had got it for you, I'm like, that's amazing. I love that they did that. Um, yeah, that was awesome. Before we pit away from from non-competes, uh, I wanted to kind of bring up, you've done some work with the Federal Federal Trade Commission in the proposal there on banning non-competes. Uh, and just as that's kind of going through and there's a lot of discussion on it, anything there noteworthy? I think you got to testify for what, like, a real quick minute or two? Well, so I, I wouldn't say I'm working with them. I have, uh, I've been engaged with them for sure. about, you know, since, uh, since about June of last year. So when I got deep into the advocacy for the non-compete, um, I reached out, I initiated contact with the FTC and they were really interested in, in what I was doing. They were really interested in the petition, things like that, like those grassroots efforts that, you know, are supported by the average American. That's what the FTC is really interested in. So when they learned that I had over 6,000 people on that petition already, they were, you know, they wanted to see that. They wanted to see some of the other materials that I had been using. So I've been exchanging information with a couple of representatives from the FTC for a while. Um, so yeah, that was really interesting. And as far, as far as my position on it today, you know, I, um, it's funny you ask that because I had received a similar question on LinkedIn not too long ago, and I want to be really clear about how I say this. If the government comes in and ends the non-compete, I'll be happy for that result, okay? Um, based on my conversations with them, they're very confident that they're going to be able to get this rule passed, and based on what I've seen so far, I'm, I'm confident too. But here's the thing, and this is where I have to be very careful in how I, how I communicate this. My goal and my intention with my advocacy to end the non-compete has been the same from day one, and that is to empower veterinary professionals to stand up and end this on their own, right? My goal has been to 
demonstrate to these veterinary professionals exactly how much power they have in this industry. This industry doesn't survive without the veterinarian, right? The veterinarian is what makes the majority of the revenue. The veterinarian depends on the veterinary technician, right? The technicians depend on, you know, their, their other, the nurses, the support staff, their hospital managers. So it's all, all integrated, right? It's all one, one tied to the, to the other. But at the end of the day, those folks, those hospital based employees, what I've been trying to do is empower them so that they can stand up and demand the work environment that they, that they want, right? So yes, I'll be happy if the government ends it, but that would mean that my advocacy has failed, right? And yeah, my efforts to empower enough veterinarians to end it themselves, that has failed if the government steps in and ends this before the veterinarians do. But at the end of the day, I'm still going to be happy. I'll still be very proud of what I've done. There are more veterinarians and veterinary professionals talking about non-competes today than ever before. And I'm not going to sit here and say it's because of me, but I do believe I had a part in it, right? And that's what's, that's what helps me sleep at night. Yeah, 100%. 100% that you've been a part of it. But yeah, I think it's important. There's been others that have, you know, kind of heard you, I think, be bold, and they've taken that up and said, I'm going to be bold as well. And that's, that's kind of cool to, to be able to see folks absolutely. do that. Um, I love seeing it. I yeah. absolutely do. Yeah. So I wanted to get into the, the new venture. You just uh, announced it fairly recently across LinkedIn and, and different social media, which is Offer First. And so I wanted to give you uh, the ability to say, A, what it is, and B, why should veterinarians and vet professionals care? Oh, well, there's going to be a lot of reasons why they should care. But Offer First, Offer First is a recruiting technology that I started working on about three years ago. Okay. Um, and Offer First differentiates itself from everything else out there because it does things that no other recruiting platform can do. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those features here in a minute. The thing is, is that, you know, right now the industry is flooded with job boards and obviously these external recruiting agencies. Um, and it's primarily due to the fact that the veterinary industry is nothing more than a war for talent right now, right? There's more there are more open jobs and there are qualified individuals to fill them. So every employer is, you know, chopping at the bit to be the first to engage with a candidate. First, the difference between Offer First and everything else is that I designed this to be a hiring platform. It is going to um, bring efficiencies to the hiring process. And I did so in a way that challenges the traditional process that everybody has known and is accustomed to. And, you know, the reason I did that is primarily because when I look at these other technologies and I start doing some research into like who started this, who was their founder, I learned that a majority of them were created by people who had zero recruiting experience whatsoever. And yeah, that's not a problem, right? They saw an opportunity and they jumped on board and they're capitalizing on that opportunity. That's great, right? That's capitalism. But I wanted to come at this from a different perspective. Yes, I did see an opportunity, but I also saw problems that I could fix. And these are problems that most people just have taken for granted, right? Most people don't even recognize them as problems because it's the only way we've ever done this process. So it's just accepted as, hey, this is how it is. So it's not a problem. It's just how it is, right? So I designed Offer First with over 21 years of recruiting experience to solve some of those legacy problems that we've all accepted. For example, um, right off the top of my head, the negotiation piece, right? The negotiation piece of the job um, search process. When you're negotiating your compensation, you're doing so with generally with the person you're going to end up reporting to, right? This is, this is your boss that you're trying to negotiate your salary with. And some people are comfortable doing that, but the majority simply are not. It is not something that people do regularly enough to be experienced in, right? The biggest problem with it is the placement of that negotiation um, phase, right? It is after you've already had your phone calls and your interviews, right? So you've already been wined and dined. The employers wooed you. They've told you several times how they want you to be part of their family, right? So now you've got 
an emotional influence going into these negotiations, right? And emotions are one of the things you want to extract from a negotiation process, right? You want this to be a very transactional process. The problem with the traditional hiring process, it enables those emotions to influence those negotiations. And what ends up happening is professionals generally take jobs for less than they're truly worth, right? And that's a problem that I wanted to fix. So with Offer First, you're going to get, like I give it away in the name, you're going to get that offer as, as the first step. All right. And you're going to be able to negotiate, you know, as a job seeker right from your phone. OK. And the offer is going to come through to you. If, if the interest is confirmed, you're going to get an offer from an employer and it's going to be a very transactional process. You're not going to have any emotional influence. Right. Because you don't you haven't spoken to them. You haven't talked to them. You haven't gone to dinner with them yet. This is purely a transactional process about what I believe I'm worth and what you believe your position is worth. And now we're going to try to find that common middle ground, but we're going to do it from a very different perspective because, yeah, I have no emotional influence anymore. I am strictly negotiating from a position of where I believe my worth is, right? And I'll take my phone and I can adjust whatever parameter that offer I want, and then I can send it back to you, right? That's my counter. And you're going to do the same thing as the employer. And then we do this volley. It's only three volleys back and forth because offer first is intended to expedite this process. But that negotiating piece, by eliminating that emotional component from it, I, believe, I truly believe candidates are going to flock to the system because it enables them to truly achieve their value. Well, and what is what is someone's time worth? I think is the other piece of this, right? Like Bingo. You're right. <laughs> Well, and there's that's tremendous savings. Yeah, there, there's absolutely <laughs> tremendous savings there, not just in my personal time, but as the employer, employers put not just time into that process, but they put a lot of money into that process, right? They're, they're paying for their team to do the assessments. They're paying for the candidates' uh, travel expenses, the interview expenses, right? So they put money into this process, the advertising, the recruiting tools. And one of the worst things for an employer is to engage in a candidate, to engage with a candidate, get them all the way to the offer stage, which could be weeks or months, depending on you know how efficient the employer's process is. And then they make that offer, realize that the value they place on their position doesn't align with the value this candidate has placed on themselves. The candidate ends up declining. That's the worst outcome, right? Because we've invested so much time and money. And now what happens? Both the candidate and the employer have to start all over. Right. Mm -hmm. So what offer first does is it eliminates the likelihood of that end of process offer decline based on compensation because we're covering it up front. Right. Let's make sure the value you place on your position aligns with the value I place on myself first. And if we're in the ballpark and we can negotiate to a, a common middle ground, great. Now, I can make an educated decision about whether or not I want to spend my personal time, which as a skilled talent professional, we know they have very little of, but now I can determine whether I want to spend my time in your process. And knowing that, hey, they're willing to compensate me at a level which I believe I am worth, I am now more likely to complete that process with you, right? And, you know, some of the feedback, you know, this was really interesting, Isaiah, because I didn't anticipate... Um, some of the feedback that I was getting during the, the first three years when I was using the manual version. But what candidates were telling me is that they were able to ask better questions in the interview, questions that they wouldn't have normally asked, because here's why. Normally, when a candidate goes into an interview process, they are hyper-focused on being perfect, Right. They're wearing the right clothes, shiny shoes, answering all the questions as best they can. But what they're really trying to do is impress everybody that they meet, because in their mind, they believe, if I impress you, I will get a higher offer. But the truth is, most employers already know what they're going to pay you before you walked in the door, plus or minus a small percentage. But in the candidate's mind, they're hyper-focused on doing that. But when you take compensation off the table and they go to that interview already knowing that your values align, well, now they're so much more relaxed and they're more comfortable and their true personality really shines through. Whereas in the traditional process, everybody knows you generally don't see the true personality of the candidate you hired until 60, 90 days on the job, right? 
Now, employers are telling me uh, very similar feedback in that their candidates, you know, they are so much more natural and they're able to get a much better fit assessment, right? They're, they're able to get a much more accurate determination of whether or not this person is going to be a fit on their team. Right. And one of the stats that I'm most proud of is 90, over 90 percent of the candidates that I placed using the manual version of Offer First over the last three years are still with their current employer. Right. So that's huge for me. Yeah. Well, and it allows you if the money discussion, which is uncomfortable, right? Like I, I, I see this all the time in financial planning, right? Money conversations are, are tricky and hard and you have to like build a relationship to, to get to those. But if you can get that out of the way, you can then really focus on fit to make sure this is somewhere I want to be. This is someone that you want to have. So I guess the question is if, if the financial part is all agreed on and then you go and you, you fly them in or you're having more conversations, you're both excited, you feel like it's a good fit. And then it's not like, how does that, do you then sever ties or like, does it, does that's, it change? Like, how does that fit if, if, if the financial stuff's good, but then it's like, I don't know. I didn't really like the way Paul talked to me kind of, you know, I just don't really know yep. if that's culturally the right fit. I mean, at that point, same thing as normal, like it just would be broken off then. Yeah. So that's a great question. And I can give you two very specific examples because that happened. Um, it, it happened only twice in the last three years, but um, so yes, that initial offer that you're making is essentially just saying, Hey, the value I place on my position, and I'm going to keep saying value I place on my position, right? Because a lot of times when I'm speaking to employers about this, they always ask, well, how do I know what I'm going to offer somebody who I haven't met yet? I haven't seen a resume. I don't know their skills. And I have to tell them this isn't about the perceived value of an individual skill set. This is the value you place on your job, on that vacant position. Every employer knows what they're willing to pay to fill every vacant seat on their team. The thing is, is that we don't, they don't promote that. They don't advertise that in the traditional process, right? There's a lot of talk right now about pay transparency, right? And how, um, you know, there's some states that are now requiring pay uh, ranges on the job descriptions. A pay range doesn't it doesn't do much to enhance transparency, all right? It's probably like the first step. But the problem is, is that, you know, they can post a huge range. And what does that mean to me as an individual, right? And as somebody with over 20 years experience in the recruiting space, I can tell you, I mean, without a doubt, when you tell a candidate the pay range, if I say, hey, the range is 100 to 175, all they hear is 175. Totally. That's right? what I'm hearing that's too. I'm a hear. great candidate, Paul. Like you want you me go. 175, baby. Let's go. 175K. <laughs> that's all I hear. So when they get through the entire process and then you offer them 120, they're disappointed, yeah. right? They're your number one candidate. You're making them the offer. You told them how great they were, but now you're going to give them 120, right? So the, the pay ranges, like on many of these job boards, it, it it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't solve the problem, right? So... What we did was when you get that initial offer, it's only about the value of the position and the value I place on myself. Once we figure out those two aligned, now the employer's normal screening process starts. So offer first doesn't replace the, the employer screening process. All it does is it changes the way in which it's occurring and it expedites it, right? Now, we agreed, right? Um, I've accepted your initial offer. Great. Now I do the phone calls. Now I do the interviews. And wow, I as a candidate, yeah, I don't like the way this one individual who I'm going to be working with really was communicating with me, right? I'm, I'm here on an interview and this was, I wasn't treated very nicely. Or wow, they told me they had all this new equipment and I get here and it's just, you know, it's, it's old equipment with polish on it, right? Um, so whatever happens, if I, through that screening process, I identified other issues, or maybe I realized this job is going to be a lot harder than they had alluded to. Well, yes, afterwards, I can also adjust that offer. I can ask for, hey, you know what? I didn't realize that I was going to have to do all this extra work. So, you know, this $120,000 you offered me isn't going to be enough, right? So there's going to be an opportunity on both sides. Now, the employer may interview somebody and say, well, crap, you know, you're a great fit. And this is exactly what happened. I had one of my candidates who the employer interviewed, they thought she was an absolute perfect fit for their, for their team, but she didn't have the level of dentistry experience that they required for their practice. So if I remember correctly, I think they offered her, she was a new grad. They offered her 130,000, um, up front. And then after realizing that she didn't have that level of dentistry experience, 
they ended up talking to her about that, right? So it, it enables that candid conversation, which is lacking in the today's process. But they, they had that conversation with her and they let her know, hey, look, because of this, we're going to drop that offer down to 120 grand. We're going to give you the training that you need. And then we'll um, reestablish that $130,000 compensation level later on. And she was all about it because she knew she was weak in that area. Right? But she also felt this was a great fit for me, too. So she accepted. So, yes, at the very end of the process, after the screening is completed, you'll have another opportunity to adjust that offer if needed. But like I said, it's only happened twice in three years. But, yes, the opportunity is there to make that adjustment. So I can hear practice owners saying, but I can't pay top dollar, so I'm not going to be able to get the candidates. And, you know, part of the reason they want to work with us is because of the culture and the other things that we provide. How, how would you reply to that that person? That's a, oh man, Isaiah. <laughs> Hard hitting questions, questions here. Hard hitting like questions. This. I like it. <laughs> no, this is great stuff. So here's the thing. My intent behind Offer First was to enable a process where all employers could compete for talent fairly. And when I say all, I'm talking specifically about that that um, private practice out in a rural area who could be practicing the best medicine in the country, right? Have the greatest benefits, have the greatest of everything, but just has no ability to get in front of the get in front of the talent the way these major corporate practices do, right? So some of the challenges that they have is obviously their budget, right? So I wanted to create a platform where these employers, all employers can compete for talent based on the quality of their culture, not the size of their budgets. And what will end up happening with Offer First is I priced it at a, I priced it at a level that I believe every private practice is going to be able to afford, right? It's going to help them alleviate their reliance on those external recruiters like like the company I own. I truly believe Offer First is going to put higher power completely out of business, hmm. right? Because I just don't think there's going to be a need for that service anymore. Um, and by reducing those other external costs that these small private practices have, they'll be able to increase their level of compensation. But the thing is, is that even if they're not the best paying um, employer out there, they're still going to be able to get access to all these candidates and they'll be able to engage these candidates and articulate why, hey, this is a better place for you, right? So I'm confident that even those small private practices, whether or not their compensation level is, you know, on par with what these corporate practices are offering, which, you know, may or may not be, I don't think it's going to be a, a hindrance to them on offer first. Yeah. No, I think that's that's a great reply. And just on the benefit side of it, I mean, how does that come into play? Because one of the things when I had my first job, right, my parents were like, oh, like health insurance, these other things, like those are benefits that you don't necessarily see in your paycheck. You need to understand that. And it kind of clicked where, you know, there might be certain practices that offer more of those benefits. Is, is there like a calculation or how is that kind of highlighted on the offer first platform? Yeah. So this first version um, we're going to rely on the employers to articulate their the value of their benefits. Um, later versions of this will that we're going to release will have an opportunity for employers to um, articulate the basics of their um, their benefit package. You know, I wanted to I want to make sure that the candidates know, hey, this employer is paying 100 percent of your benefits, right? Versus, you know, this corporate employer is only paying 50 percent. Right? So this corporate employer may be offering you 130000 I'm offering you 110000 but I'm paying 100% of your benefits, right? So there's, mm -hmm. you know, I want, I want to be able to demonstrate the value of those benefit packages as well. But again, this first version that I'm putting out, this is the MVP, right? The minimum viable product. We're launching it in the veterinary industry first because that's where I believe I have the strongest network. And, you know, this community has just been so supportive of me. So I, I believe that they'll, they'll gravitate towards a product that I've created because they trust me, right? And they, they know that I'm creating something that's going to be a benefit for them. So yeah, this first version we rely we we really don't touch on the benefits um, components of a, of an offer at this point. It's essentially just the seven main um, components of a standard offer, and then the employer is uh, the the employer will articulate the value of their benefits to every candidate that they engage. Gotcha. Can you for someone that doesn't do recruiting day in and day out, and probably like a lot of listeners, the seven points or been like of an offer you walk through yeah. what those are um, 
Yeah, now you're testing me. Make I know, sure I, I remember. I, I'm really stuff. trying to see if I can. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's see if I can get this. It's going to be base pay, sign on relocation bonuses, productivity, vacation time, CE allowance, CE um, time off. Was that seven? Base, sign on. I, I didn't relo. count. As, we're gonna we're gonna say yes. All right, I'll take a yes then. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> tell everyone um, there there wasn't an edit there. That was the first that was the first time because you never know. Like we weren't doing this live, but Paul got it. So um, there you go. Perfect. That that helps me understand it as well um, with those different pieces. With the other thing that you said, I and and it's with offer first, but I think it's really interesting. It's like I have this business, but I'm also gonna launch something else that may monopolize or like you know eat into that right from a revenue perspective. And I just think of so many different companies that sit on their laurels, right? Don't ever innovate, don't do anything differently. And then just wait to get someone else to come along and, and you know, creatively destruction, like build something better. And you're doing that. I love that. So I think kudos well, to, to be forward thinking to go do that. Well, I appreciate that, as I really do. And my intent with Higher Power was to create a business that I could eventually put out of business, right? I wanted to test that model. And I wanted to test the offer first process, right? And just like you said, there's there's so many people that have created the same thing, all right? So think about the veterinary industry alone. There's so many recruiting technologies that are focused on the veterinary industry. Most of them are, are, are job boards, right? They're essentially glorified job boards. They all do the same thing. They just look different, right? They may have different colors and, and cute little caricatures and stuff like that, but nobody I mean, not even the big ones. Indeed, Monster, LinkedIn, nobody has challenged the traditional hiring process. I truly believe that this process is a huge waste of time. It puts the skilled talent professional's time at risk and a large amount of that time. You know, I, I, I'm willing to bet so many of your listeners will resonate with this in that hundreds, thousands. I mean, so many people have gotten into this engagement with an employer, right? They may have been told a pay range up front. They, they, they put their best foot forward. They spend all their personal time into this process. And then at the very end, we talk about the alignment of our values, right? At the very end. And it's done so. That process was created eons ago, okay? But it was created intentionally to put the employer in the driver's seat, right? And why can I say that? Because I've used it for 21 years. I mean, think about, we, we already talked about the negotiating piece, right? It's, it's placed, that stage is placed after I had the opportunity to, to influence you emotionally, right? So that puts the, the, the employer in the driver's seat. And now I've already given you all of my personal time. And now you're making me an offer. And here's what happens more often than not. If I'm a candidate who's done this three or four times, Isaiah, and then I get to the fifth, fourth or fifth time, and the employer offers me less than I really wanted. Now I'm starting to think, do I want to do this all over again? Or, yeah, I can live with this, right? It's not what I wanted, but I can live with it because I don't want to go and do this all over again. Apply, phone calls, interviews, pack a bag. I, I'm just tired, right? So they accept the job for less than they're worth. And that's what I'm trying to fix. That's one of the things I'm trying to fix, right? So now... You know, even candidates who don't, who aren't actively looking for a job, we call them passive candidates. That's what employers want. They want the passive candidate. They, there's not a single technology out there, nothing. You know, I'll challenge you to name off a couple in the veterinary industry and I'll, I'll show you, no, they don't do this. But there's not a single technology out there that adds value to that passive candidate. The one who's not actively looking for a job, but hey, if the right opportunity crossed my path, I'd, I'd consider it, right? That's the passive candidate. With Offer First, you're going to be able to quickly create a profile, right? And even if you're not looking for, if not actively looking for a job, you're going to be able to utilize my platform to determine the competitiveness of your current compensation because you could still get offers from employers, right? So if I'm a veterinarian making 150 grand a year, right? And I use, uh, I'm happy in my role, you know, I'm not necessarily looking for another job and I'm using offer first and I get an offer for 110, 115. Ah, no, I'm not, that's not going to entice me. And then all of a sudden somebody sends me an offer for 175 grand to do the same thing I'm doing today. Hey, you know what? That might be something I'm interested in, in, in learning more about, right? So now I'll engage with you. 
And now this is your opportunity to tell me why what you have is better than what I currently have. Right. It may not just be all about the money. The money got my attention. Right. The money got my attention. But now let's figure this out. And now I can make that educated decision around how I'm going to spend my personal time. Right. The traditional process doesn't allow that. And there's not a technology out there that solves this problem other than offer first. So I truly believe the professional talent out there is going to recognize, hey, this is different. This adds value to me. I am not going to risk my time anymore. Right. That's the little time that I have. So that's why I believe once this word gets out, I truly believe Offer First is going to be the, the single source um, for for recruiting talent. The passive candidate piece, to me, that that's a key, key, key element here. It's like you're going to be able to find good people that may, yeah, oh, maybe I am not quite as happy. Or I had a conversation because we, we see this too with, with clients at Vincere, right? We'll, we'll talk, they might be somewhere and they're like, yeah, it's fine. But again, same thing. I'm too busy, you know, kids, spouse, other things I want to do. They don't want to go through the interview process and do all that other jazz. But if they could almost like a, I don't know, I think about like Zillow, right? When people are like, oh, I'm just going to like sit on the couch and like Zillow scroll for a little bit, just think, you do the same thing with a job, right? Like you don't have first go through, look and say, oh, that's actually really interesting. Maybe, maybe we want to look at that, right? Um and that's wild to think about. Well, I like so I, I've got, I've got a, I could one up that for you, right. right? Because the experience you're describing is, uh, it's a very passive experience where most candidates, that's the experience they have on the tools available today, right? All these job boards. I'm going to, I post my resume, right? Or, or I create, you know, I, I create my basic profile, um, upload the resume, and all of a sudden, now I'm scrolling through listings, right? And I've got to find the one that's appropriate for me. Well, offer first, no resume required on offer first, right? Uh, to be honest with you, I think the resume is going to be dead in five to 10 years, probably closer to five. I think it's antiquated. Um, and put it this way, professionals spend so much time on their resumes. I know I've been there before. I'm sure you have too, right? We want to make sure because in our minds, we believe, hey, this is our first step, right? This is, this is our putting our, our best foot forward and it's got to be absolutely perfect. So they spend a lot of money, spend a lot of time and a skilled recruiter, a skilled recruiter will spend 30 to 60 seconds on a resume. Okay. An entry level recruiter will spend about a minute, minute and a half. Okay. <laughs> That's how much time we look at your resumes, right? So what I did with Offer First is I created a process where I don't need your resume. I need you to answer very specific questions and not many of them, all right? It takes less than five minutes to complete either my candidate or employer profile. On the candidate profile, I've narrowed it down to just the questions I need to determine the type of job you want and the qualifications you have for it. Are you minimally qualified to do this job? If so, great. We will figure out what level you're at later on, right? But right now, all we need is, are you qualified to do the job? What type of job you want, okay? And then obviously, we empower these candidates to um, assess their own professional value, right? So they can put, they'll enter that into the profile as well. Now, what happens when both those profiles are completed is offer first matches jobs with candidates based on the profile inputs versus resume and job description keywords, which is what everybody else does. And that has been one of the biggest failures um, in the recruiting space. I mean, Harvard Business Review, Forbes, they've done tons of articles about this, the, the matching capabilities of um, a lot of these technologies that are coming out, right? Where, hey, upload your resume, we match the keywords to job descriptions, and you'll get a great candidate. Well, it's been proven to have failed more often than not, and very high-skilled candidates have been passed over for jobs that they were very well qualified for. But with Offer First, I've now I've cut out all that BS, right? This isn't about keywords. This is about very specific profile questions. Everything is a drop-down, and that's going to match you to those jobs. And we do so in two different categories. You have your match feed and your discovery feed. The match feed is where you're going to find positions that match with your profile inputs at 85, or I'm sorry, 80% or better. And then the, the discovery feed is where you'll find all the others, right? And the reason I did that originally, it was just a match feed. 
And then I realized, hey, I'm missing out on a huge demographic. And here's here's um, what I learned later on. You may not have anything in your match feed, right, um, as a candidate, because let's say maybe your parameters are way too high. You're asking for $200,000 base pay and you're a one-year experienced veterinarian, right? That's probably not going to happen. But what the discovery feed enables both users to do is see where they need to compromise to get more matches, right? Mm. So I may not have matched with um, any hospitals in my area on my match feed, but then I look at the discovery feed and I see, whoa, there's a hospital right around the street from where I live. I could ride my bicycle into work. And the only reason I'm not matching with them is because I my base pay is $10,000 higher than they want it. Right. And I was asking for too much in a sign on bonus and maybe too much in CE credits or whatever it is. Right. But now I can look at this and say, well, crap, to ride a bike to work. Yeah, that, that, I, I don't need that much. CE. I don't need this. I could compromise here and there. Right? And there's still that opportunity to negotiate. But now I'm going to see even those jobs that aren't a perfect match, because maybe my parameters, maybe I don't know what the market is for my professional skill set. Offer First is going to help you determine that, right? And it's going to enable you to negotiate in ways that the traditional process and traditional tools never have been able to help you, right? So that's the value this adds to the job seeker and the employer. Hmm. Makes total sense to me. That, yeah. If it makes sense to you, then, yeah. then I'm on the right path. I was going to say, I don't know. That's not saying a whole lot. So let's let's not get too excited here. <laughs> um, what What haven't I asked about or we, we discussed on, on offer first, um, that you think is important for, for folks to know? Well, um, let's talk about one of the biggest problems in the recruiting space right now that no technology has been able to solve ghosting, right? Mm. Ghosting, one of the most disappointing and frustrating aspects of the job search. And it's happening at a rate that is more frequent now than ever. Right. And it's happening on both sides. Right. So ghosting is when essentially you engage in a process or you engage in a conversation and all of a sudden the other party just disappears on you and you're left not knowing what's going on. And for a candidate, that can be just heartbreaking. Right. Because especially if they got into the later stages, I, I've heard of candidates getting ghosted after receiving a verbal offer and mm -hmm. then never hearing back from the employer. I mean, it's just it, it truly is heartbreaking um, for the employer. Right. Gosh, I, I can only imagine how frustrating it can be for an employer to spend so much time and money to entice a candidate to engage with them. And then all of a sudden, hey, never heard back from them, right? So Offer First is the only platform, Isaiah, that can guarantee no user will ever get ghosted, okay? Um, and I did that intentionally, again, because I recognized that is a problem, right? Nobody likes to engage in a process or to engage in any type of dialogue, conversation, relationship, whatever it is, and simply just be left in the dark without knowing, right? Um, so my experience in recruiting, again, has pointed out that, hey, this is a huge problem. I mean, I've experienced it myself. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I could give a differentiated experience to my users. And, you know, I think I've differentiated so many components already, but ghosting was a big one for me, right? And it took me, you know, I mean, the solution for it was relatively simple, um, but I do believe it's going to, it's going to end up being something that others try to copy and emulate, which is why I've, I've got, I'm patent pending on just about everything that I'm telling you about right now. So uh, this should, I mean, I'm afforded a little bit of protection there, but at the same time, I'm fine with that. Right. Let's the competition's good. Right. I'm the non-compete guy. Right. So mm -hmm. let, let's compete and see who can differentiate more than, more than um, the next person. But I truly believe that what we're bringing to market is different from anything else out there right now. And everybody else is going to play catch up. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I get that there's there's certain parts of it where it's like yeah there's a little bit that I want to want to you know keep my cards a little closer to the chest on because I'm like hear the word guarantee in my business I'm always like okay ears perk up tell me more about that how do we how are we doing that so I'll you know uh, what I'll let no, people you know what? wonder a little bit um, no you know what let's not make them wonder I, I don't want right, people to wonder right. so you know what it'll, it'll be the first time I'm actually talking about it I could sense that you wanted to ask about it and exclusive I'm glad you did. <laughs> exclusive very good I like it so I designed. 
a process and offer first to prevent anybody from not knowing what's happening, right? So the way it works is, let's say you're the employer, I'm the candidate. Um, I see your job on offer first and I express interest, right? You're going to be notified and it's going to say, hey, and these aren't the exact words, okay? But <laughs> it'll tell you, hey, Isaiah, Paul's interested in your job. You've got 72 hours to respond to it, right? And then over the next 72 hours, you're going to get prompted by our system, right? Until you take an action. The last prompt you're going to get is going to say something to the effect of, hey, Paul expressed interest in your job. Um, you've got until 2 p.m. today to respond. You know, otherwise we're going to respond for you or something for that matter. And what happens is if you don't take the action, I am going to receive a message and it's going to say, hey, Paul, you know what? Unfortunately, you know, Isaiah is not interested at this time, but there's plenty of other opportunities and offer first, you know, make sure you check your match and discovery feeds, blah, blah, blah. So basically, everybody is going to know what happened, whether you answered it or not. The candidate and the employer will get a response. Now, in the later versions of Offer First, um, some, one of the, some of the enhancements, we're going to create a process where both candidates and employers are going to have a, a rating, right? Based on how they engage, yeah. right? To keep everybody, keep everybody accountable and keep everybody above board, right? So if you're an employer with like a, you know, a two star rating because you're relying on system notifications all the time, well, you're probably not going to be somebody employ or candidates want to engage with, mm -hmm. right? So it's going to drive transparency. It's going to drive accountability. But at the end of the day, it's also going to prevent everybody from not knowing, right? I don't want people waiting, um, you know, waiting for a no answer, right? That just doesn't make sense to me. So, you know, the other intent behind Offer First, and if you look at my logo, the logo is a clock, right? And it was intentionally created that way because, Offer First is going to save time for both users and employers. It's going to expedite this process. It's going to move it very quickly. Right? It's like I said, this isn't a job board like everybody else. This is a hiring platform. You use Offer First if you want to hire somebody or if you want to get hired. Right? And if you're in one of those two camps, you should be willing and able to move through the process as quickly as possible, right? So I tell employers all the time, if you're going to post a job anywhere, what you're doing is saying, this now is a priority, right? Mm -hmm. Everything else comes second to this, right? We're not going to make these candidates wait. And one of the, the, the key components to winning the war for talent, especially in the veterinary industry, is speed. If you cannot move this candidate quickly, somebody else will come and take them. It's just that simple, right? We already know there's a, you know, there's this perceived shortage of veterinarians. There are more jobs than there are veterinarians. So if you can't make it happen, somebody else will. But Offer First is going to help everybody facilitate an expedited process. It'll be fun to, uh, to see and be able to, to schedule a, a third round to have you come back and, and share the kind of lessons learned in, I think you, you, you hit on a couple of things where it's like, hey, this is the MVP. This is where we're starting and this is going to work and it's great. But yeah, it's not going to be perfect out of the box. You're going to learn stuff. You're going to tweak things. Absolutely. And, and that makes sense, right? So uh, I think with, with any, you know, we talk about practice ownership all the time. You learn by doing and you're going to learn by doing. Again, you have the 20 plus years of experience. You've learned by doing. And then you've taken those not, that, that knowledge and then implement it into a, a tool and then the tool will continue to get better o over time as well. But I appreciate you sharing the uh, the ghosting thing. It makes total sense. Shoot, I should have been able to like say, hey, Paul, I'm going to guess. And this is how I would do it. <laughs> but I was, I was <laughs> thinking, I was like, okay, yeah, how, how, how do you do that? But it's perfect. Um, well, as we wind down, I always let guests, and I can't remember when we recorded the first time, if, if I let you ask a question, it doesn't matter if you did, um, because I want to allow you to ask a, a question to me. And it could be anything. It could be fun. It can be serious. It can be about recruiting. I don't know a lot. So please don't ask me the hard question on recruiting. Cause I'm gonna be like, I don't know. Ask Paul. <laughs> so, uh, anything top of mind, anything you want to chat through or discuss? Tell me what you know about, um, Silicon Valley bank. Oh man. I just recorded, uh, I, well, so when we're recording this, I had just, uh, released an episode. So I think it's one seventy seven. It's like 14 minutes. It's pretty quick. Okay. Um, I'll send it to you. Uh, but basically it is, uh, part of 
just the current system. So when you have a fractional reserve system, right, we're not going to hold everything there. Um, so fractional being banks take in deposits, what they keep in house, uh, their reserve requirements were able to move be, since May 26, 2020 to 0%. So they have to hold 0% of the deposit. They could loan everything out. It doesn't matter. Like they used to be 10%. Okay. It's been zero for a while. Anyways, even at 10%, fractional reserve banking is always going to go through these kind of crises because when, when people want to get funds out, they, they run into issues. There's, there's nuance here. There's some things with interest rates. So interest rates are really low. These banks had bought treasury bonds as interest rates go up. That's bad for bond prices. When they're trying to get funds back and sell things to uh, generate money, right? They are uh, all of a sudden kind of caught in a, a spiral of the price of that asset that they're selling is going down to meet depositors uh, that are wanting to withdraw their money. And it was a little bit of a, uh, it, it 100% was a bank run, but SVB is not uncommon, it, but it, what it was, it was very concentrated. So they had a concentration in VC, private equity. There's some fat companies that have uh, some ownership uh, that had some ties there. Not that we need to get into each individual one, and I'd probably miss some anyways, but absolutely were, you know, different companies that are even in the, the veterinary space that had, you know, deposits at SVB that, you know, if they weren't 100% backstop, which they were, so all depositors, even those over the amount of the 250 FDIC insurance amount were made whole. Now, my question is, um, there's a term called moral hazard. And moral hazard is basically this thing that if, if I know that I'm always going to get bailed out and things will be fine because I make a mistake, I don't learn my lesson. If I touch the hot stove and never get burned, you don't learn your lesson. And my fear is when we do things like this, and it was 100% a bailout, and there's some nuance to that, but we don't have to get into it here. Um, you're going to incentivize bad behavior. And the other thing that is happening is it's going to incentivize the, I need to hold my deposits with the biggest banks out there because I know they're too big to fail. But the little old Indiana rural bank, no one's going to give a shit about it. And they're going to let that one fail. And how's that fair to me versus the people that were out in Silicon Valley? It doesn't matter that it's in Silicon Valley. If it was in Austin, Texas, Seattle, Washington, Chicago, Illinois. What, what happened is the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, and the FDIC deemed it to be a systematic risk for a bank that was 200 billion in deposits and 15, it was the 15th biggest bank in the, the country. If your system is robust and anti-fragile and we should not be worried about the banking system, then why is that a systematic risk? That's the question that every single person should be asking. For those that are watching uh, the, uh, the YouTube feed, you can see I have my Bitcoin Britney shirt on for a very uh, specific reason, right? Um, yeah, there, there, there are solutions to this and I think more people are gonna start waking up to hey, is this money that I actually have in the bank, is it mine? And I think that's a question you should be asking. So that's the, that's the quick version, but I'll, I'll send you the link. It's, a, it's 14 minutes. I ran a little bit, but I'm trying to take other uh, resources from other people smarter than me and just kind of distill it down to what I think matters ultimately, which is, you know, it sucks. I don't want people to lose stuff because if you let those depositors, depositors go bankrupt, there's businesses that can't make payroll. There's people that are gonna lose their homes. That's not good. I don't root for that. I don't want the world to burn. That's not my goal, but it's, it's also, you have to have some responsibility. And I, I believe in that. And I know you believe in that as well. Like at some point you have to take self-responsibility for decisions made. And if you make a bad decision, uh, you should have to live with the consequences. And I think ultimately what we're doing is uh, not letting people actually take responsibility and, and, and bailing them out. You know, even the, the first the, the first time all those banks failed, right? There, I can't recall any consequences for any of those CEOs, any of those, anybody in the, no. those executive leadership teams. They're, they're I mean, they, they all even got their, their end of year bonuses from yeah. those bailouts. So it, 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 it's disheartening that these things can happen. Um, they've got the, the golden parachutes and they're going to be all right. And everybody else just gets screwed. Yeah. Well, and it's a little different this time. And I've had some internal discussions where people see things differently. I think it was the wrong decision. I think it's a bad decision, point blank. Okay. But so those that had equity, so if they own the, the shares of SVB, they're zeros. So they're not going to get bailed out. And apparently they're going to try to claw back some of the bonuses. But I mean, you look at different banks that have had major trouble right now, like First Republic uh, of California, the uh, leadership team sold like $170 million worth of their stock, like right before all this. Like there's some shady stuff that's gone on. And it's, again, if you don't hold people accountable back in the great financial crisis, guess what? They're going to expect the same treatment now. Same and it's thing. going to be like, oh, well, you know, this happened the other time. So like they're going to expect the same thing. And then all of a sudden someone has to step up and be the bad guy when actually it's just holding them to account. So, yeah, I, I think the, uh, the financial services world is, is has a bad reputation and it's earned 100 percent. It's earned. I get it. I get um, it. So it is frustrating, but it's a great, great question. And 
Um, there's a lot more nuance and I'm not going to claim to be the expert on everything. Um, so well, when, whenever I have questions about <laughs> any kind of money matters, you're the one I go to. So I appreciate your perspective on it. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. And um, it's a, it's a great question. It's a question on everyone's mind. I feel like uh, over the past couple of weeks is kind of what's going on, wow. what, like what the hell's going on. Right. Cause is, should I be worried? Is it fine? It's like, eh, well, how long do you have? Right. But just on the, the appreciation piece uh, I know I, I say this for countless other people. I appreciate it. I mean, having boldness, sticking your neck out there and saying, this is what I believe in, um, regardless of whether someone has to agree with everything that, that you say or do is completely different. I have respect for people that I think their opinion is wrong, but if they're going to have <laughs> conviction in it and have a reason for why they believe what they believe, to me, that that is that speaks volumes to have your own opinion and, and generate that. And so thank you for doing what you're doing. But also, I, I love the idea of saying like, I'm not just going to complain about the problem. I'm going to bring solutions to the table and I'm going to be about that. And that's one thing that I respect about you. So thank you. I appreciate that. Isaiah. Thank you. Uh, so for those that want to sign up, learn more, ah. connect with you, let, uh, give them a good handoff. I mean, at this point, if, yeah. I mean, if they don't know you, they, they should, but I want to make sure that you have a spot that you can. Pick so that. if you don't know me, the best place to find me is on LinkedIn. So just go to LinkedIn, type in Paul Diaz and you'll find me. I'm, I, I'm sure I'm, I promise you it'll be easy for you to find me. Yep. Um, as far as offer first, whether you're a job seeker, um, a veterinary professional job seeker, or an employer, you can sign up at um, offerfirst.com forward slash early sign up. Um, and it's going to ask you how you heard about this. So if you heard about it on Isaiah's podcast, please put that in there. So this way I, I, I'll know. Um, employers, if you do sign up early prior to our launch, We'll be giving um, all employers a thousand dollars off of our per hire fee uh, for an entire year if you sign up prior to the launch. Um, and then job seekers, uh, another differentiator for Offer First, we're the only platform that is going to give every job seeker five hundred dollars for accepting a job on Offer First. So. If you go through that process, you accept a job, you stay with that employer for 90 days, we're going to send you a check for 500 bucks. All right. So and that's something the employers should know as well. Right. Because um, employers should utilize their investments or their budget for tools that actually add value to the job seeker and offer first is top of that list. So it's offerfirst.com forward slash early sign up. Um, and yeah, connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Awesome. I'm going to have to, to put in, in the notes that folks need to stay around to the end because that's a pretty compelling offer, especially for, uh, those looking for talent. So appreciate that. Thank you for your time. Great to see you as always. Same here, Isaiah. Great seeing you. You take care. Have you ever walked into a space and thought, wow, this place is beautiful. There's a reason for that. Architecture has this innate ability to impact emotions and perceptions. My friends at Apex Design Build bring beautiful and functional spaces for veterinarians nationwide. Apex is a fourth generation family run company that is fully integrated from the design, architecture and construction process. They help you mitigate risk, eliminate surprises, save time, save money and reduce your efforts. Sounds great. Check out their amazing work and have access to their square footage calculator to help you plan out your expansion or new build. Click the link in the show notes for the exclusive offer and learn more about Apex Design Build. Are you tired of waiting for the ownership discussion to happen? Frustrated with broken promises? Enter Innovative Management Veterinary Solutions or IVMS. IVMS's goal is to grow privately held, profitable, and unique hospitals across Canada, allowing you, the veterinarian, to focus on the medicine and not the practice nuances. They handle accounting, bookkeeping, marketing, advertising, human resources management, and so much more. So the plan is easy as one, two, three. First, you come work jointly with the leadership team for a year, learn the systems and processes. Ensure it's a great fit for everyone involved. Step two, you're going to enter into a 50-50% partnership to launch your hospital. Again, you help drive where it goes. Three, you work together to launch and scale your hospital. Questions? Head to the link in the show notes for more information and how to connect to see if this is the opportunity you've been waiting for. Find out for yourself why Shepherd Veterinary Software is the nation's fastest growing practice management software. Why, you ask? Isaiah's reason? Shepherd is innovating and will continue to do so into the future. Founded by Dr. Cindy Barnes, Shepherd is intuitive, super easy to learn, and streamlines practice management. Built for vets, by vets. It works for you and your team, so you have more time to spend on what's most important, your patients. 
Shepard automatically updates the medical records, adds services to the invoice, generates discard instructions, and so much more. Bring home more stories and less stress. Grow your practice. Check them out at Shepherd Vet. That is www.shepherd.vet. Hate drama? Yes, we do too. That's why it does not exist here. It's the only core value that is non-negotiable. Culture is key at Point Grey Veterinary Hospital in Vancouver, British Columbia, an outdoor person's paradise. Privately owned, fear-free, uh, one of three in the lower mainland, no catches, no hidden terms, no negative accrual, no non-competes, which our friend Paul Diaz would love, and fully transparent. So what do they expect? Sense of humor? They love to laugh, tell jokes and banner, be adaptable, be a strong team-oriented personality with drive and willingness to excel. What you should expect? Do you love snacks? Who doesn't? They have a staff room full of snacks and you're covered for your day. Coffee, tea, they have you covered. Enjoy two months schedule made in advance so you can actually plan your life. No nights or Sundays guaranteed. Salary up to $170,000, including a 22 to 25% commission. Visa sponsorship considered, as well as opportunities for ownership. So reach out today to Point Grey Veterinary Hospital. Why do banks seem to always be impersonal, slow to answer questions, or give you the runaround when you need money for your dreams? Enter Panacea Financial. Panacea Financial is a nationwide digital bank built for doctors by doctors. Whether you're a veterinarian in training, practice owner, or aspire to be a practice owner someday, Panacea Financial is a bank designed specifically for you. It was started by two doctors who were frustrated working with banks and so started their own to serve their community. With common sense lending guidelines and fast, fast decisioning, they've helped doctors all across the country start, grow, or acquire their dream practice. Looking to buy into a practice, Panacea helps doctors with practice buy-in loans, and they are funded in a matter of days. If you're ready to join the thousands of doctors nationwide who have decided to get independence from traditional banks, visit PanaceaFinancial.com today to see how you can get your dream practice started. Panacea Financial is a division of Premise member FDIC. Recruiting team members in your veterinary practice has never been this hard. You can either bury your head in the sand and hope it goes away or adapt. Inner Guardian Vets. By leveraging best-in-class technology, you can empower your staff and reduce their workload. Help reduce burnout. You also provide a better experience for your clients and patients, which you want to do as you serve them. The solutions Guardian Vets offers includes after-hours triage, virtual CSRs, that know your team and processes, telemedicine, and so much more. Become the employer of choice in your area by offering the best tools to position your team for success. Whether you're starting a de novo clinic, multi-doctor, or multi-location, Guardian Vets can help you be more efficient and effective. Go to the website, guardianvets.com, click the Get Started button, then let them know that I sent you, right? Let them know the Vet Success Podcast sent you. Get 50% off your first month. Don't let another quarter or year happen before you start making changes because you know you need to. So talk to the Guardian Vets team today and implement. All right. So there are a lot of great job postings that I want to get to. And so we're going to start off with Bayside Hospital for Animals. Great work-life balance in beautiful Fort Walton Beach, Florida. No weekends, Monday to Friday, eight to five, no on-call or emergencies. It's an appointment only here. Currently a two and a half doctor practice, new owner in 2021, bringing some fresh life into the hospital. Um, the new owner had been there for six years prior working, so definitely understands the team, the processes in the community. Lots of investment in people and new equipment. ProSal is the pay structure. Far too many benefits for me to list. Email BaysideVet251 at Yahoo or call 850-864-1857. Join a thriving, growing, small animal practice in Vermont on the Quebec border. Full-time, ideal, part-time is considered. The idea is to start with yes with the team, patients and clients in outdoorsmen or outdoor woman's paradise while uh, being able to practice high-quality medicine. Compensation is write your own structure within production capabilities. Literally, it is the owner wants to find the right person and is happy to negotiate, chat through, and find the right fit. If you want autonomy and a boss that enjoys teaching, reach out to Newport Veterinary Hospital. You can email newportveterinaryhospital at gmail.com. Uh, North Central Indiana, looking for an oasis in the chaos. You know, who isn't, right? Come join the amazing team at Fulton County Veterinary Clinic. They strive to foster a fun, fast-paced work environment while providing quality patient care. They utilize the support staff efficiently so that the doctor is available 
practice medicine and do what you're trained to do in less time and paperwork, which is great. Lots of investment in new equipment and technology to support you full-time or part-time available. Small animal and exotics are both seen there. So no ER, no on-call, no weekends, competitive salary with sign-on bonus offered and far too many benefits to list. Um, go to Fulton County Veterinary Clinic. So type that in and you'll find the job posting there. Last but not least, join Watertown Animal Hospital. Personal, personable, small animal veterinarian wanted for well-established current five doctor mixed animal practice in Northern New York, which is an outdoors person's paradise. Again, two of those. So if you like the outdoors, you can look at Vermont or New York. We They have plenty of support staff with six uh, CSRs, six licensed technicians, four animal caretakers, two technical assistants, hospital associate, or sorry, hospital assistant, a practice manager, and a bookkeeper. Focuses on mentorship and investment um, on the people and the technology. Um, that's been a strategic initiative by the leadership team. No on-call, a uh, 24-hour ER less than an hour away. Salary based on experience, but no less than 95000 Can be straight salary, pro-sal considered. Want to discuss that with the right person. Uh, tons of benefits. Again, too much to list. Please reach out to Watertown petcare.com for that option as well. So again, if you find a role or a job or talk to anyone and it helps you in any way, I would love to hear that feedback. So please reach out. Let me know what um, you're able to do. And I will continue to post these. So if you are an owner, reach out to me, let me know. And uh, we'll go from there. And until I hit a capacity of I can't keep recording these, I want to let people know um, who are high quality owners around the country looking for great help. So with that, uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks for listening to today's show. The comments made on today's show should not be taken as investment, tax, or legal advice. All comments are for educational purposes only. You should talk to your professional team before implementing anything. If you want or need financial advice, my day job on Not Podcasting is helping veterinarians grow their net worth. Our team is taking new clients and we are ready to talk to you at any stage of life. Come as you are. I always say bring the mess, right? Like if things are unorganized, that's okay. There's no prerequisites to become a client. Isaiah Douglas is a partner at Vincere Wealth Management. Isaiah is a registered investment advisor registered with the SEC. The biggest compliment you can give me in the podcast is to share it with a friend. Reviews help the show get found and Apple Podcast is the platform that is predominantly used for people listening to the show. If you have three minutes, love the show, head over to Apple Podcasts, give us an honest rating and review. It helps more people find the show. Also, the new YouTube channel is up and I'd love to have you subscribe. Vainly, I want 100 subscribers at least. Lots more, obviously, right? But I get a vanity URL if we get to 100. That would be great. It makes it easier to find the YouTube channel as well. For all of today's links, information, head over to the Veterinary Success Podcast.com. There you can subscribe to your favorite podcasting platform. It'll be a link to that YouTube channel I just talked about. You won't miss any other episodes, whether you listen on Spotify, whether you have some other ancillary podcast platform. Please like, subscribe, all that stuff. It certainly does help. I appreciate it. Finally, if you want more information, insights, want your voice to be heard, want to share ideas for content, say, hey, Isaiah, I want you to have this guest. I want you to talk about this topic. Go over to the Facebook group. So you can search for the Veterinary Success Podcast on Facebook or head over to veterinariansuccesspodcast.com. Scroll to the bottom about your host, click on the Facebook icon, and that'll get you in the group. But thank you so much for listening. It means a lot to me to be able to see the podcast grow and continue to impact people. So with that, until next time, we'll 